so much for coming. Um, it's, it's a special honor to speak to the members of League of Women Voters, uh, not only because of the work that you, that you do and have done historically, but because um, part of a chapter I'm working on for, working on for way too long, uh, on the contested meaning of citizenship in the United States and the role of organized women in some of the struggles um, um, uh, around citizenship, concerns the uh, work of the League of Women Voters in the early years um, after uh, passage of the 19th Amendment, including, uh, including citizenship schools part of the good government movement in the 1920s. So thank you for this invitation. We uh, approach today's topic on the day that uh, uh, Judge Neil Gorsuch has just been confirmed to the Supreme Court, uh, replacing the late Antonin Scalia. To get there, the Senate Republicans had to end the possibility of filibustering the Supreme Court nomination. The Democrats in 2013 had previously ended such a possibility for judicial nominees to the lower federal courts uh, during Obama's second term. Um, on most matters, Gorsuch's votes are likely to match Scalia's. If the case just decided by the Seventh Circuit Court in Chicago got to the Supreme Court for a similar kind of decision, uh, in which a federal court found that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, um, uh, barring discrimination in employment, actually included gays and lesbians, these two justices might have come to different conclusions. It's one of the areas that I think will be interesting to watch. The EEOC findings in a complaint resolved just in 2015 uh, now holds that sexual orientation is inherently a sex-based consideration. And an allegation of discrimination based on sexual orientation is necessarily an allegation of sex discrimination under Title VII. A complainant alleging that an agency took his or her sexual orientation into account in an employment action necessarily alleges that the agency took his or her sex into account. Discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, says the EEOC, is premised on sex-based preferences, assumptions, expectations, stereotypes, or norms. Sexual orientation as a concept cannot be defined or understood without reference to sex. So Justice Scalia almost always held that an agency, as so long as the agency's interpretation of a federal statute it was charged with implementing, did not clearly run afoul of a clear expression of what Congress said or directed in the statute, it would be judged by a reasonableness standard. I don't make that point. A very low and deferential standard of scrutiny. So when agencies promulgate administrative rules, Scalia was generally deferential. This included the EEOC, which can help explain why there were so many liberal decisions by conservative justices on sexual harassment cases, because the EEOC at some point defined sex to include sexual harassment uh, in the definition of sex discrimination. The rule of deference is known as the Chevron rule. Justice Stevens wrote in that case, if Congress has explicitly left a gap for the agency to fill, there is an express delegation of authority to the agency to elucidate a specific provision. Sometimes the legislative delegation to an agency on a particular question is implicit rather than explicit. In such a case, the court may not substitute its own construction of a statutory provision for a reasonable interpretation made by the administration administrator of an agency. So this is known as the Chevron rule. It largely took the interpretation of regulatory statutes out of the hands of courts. The rule can be seen as a kind of restraint on judicial activism, at least from one perspective. The court is not substituting its reading of the statute for that provided by the administrative agency. Judge Gorsuch has denounced the Chevron deference as a judge-made doctrine for the abdication of judicial duty. 
So what would this mean for a declaration that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 covers employment discrimination against gays and lesbians? because of the EEOC interpretation that I just read to you about discrimination on the basis of sex. Justice Scalia, were he alive, might possibly have deferred holding his nose. But Judge Gorsuch would very likely not. So this is a case that might get to the Supreme Court. Um, there is a tension between Obergefell's um, finding of a fundamental right to marry and the many state laws that do not provide any protection against discrimination in employment, housing, and other things for gays and lesbians. So that is one of the frontiers that we would expect the courts to be walking into in recent, uh, in, in the near future. So bottom line, who sits on the Supreme Court does matter, and it matters for decisions about the electoral process too. In a number of these recent cases, the court has been closely and sometimes bitterly divided. Uh, a lot of these are five four decisions. Robert Jackson, who served as Franklin Roosevelt Solicitor General and then Attorney General before being elevated to the court in 1941, was frustrated that the Supreme Court had overturned so much New Deal legislation, and once said that never in its entire history has the Supreme Court been representative of anything other than the most conservative forces of its day. That's not an exact quote, but it's pretty close. Um, when we think about the court's role in the electoral process, does that seem like an accurate, accurate characterization? One measure of the court's conservatism could be the number of acts of Congress overturned. Uh, a number of Supreme Court scholars think that the court rarely overturns federal legislation favored by the dominant regime, re political regime. Uh, Keith Whittington at Princeton found in a careful investigation of judicial review that most laws overturned were more than eight years old, and that the parts overturned were not of central importance to the political, the dominant regime and its political agenda. The new, early New Deal stands as a slight aberration in a much longer pattern. Uh, FDR had no court appointment, appointments in his first term, as I suspect you know. The court, however, was found to be more active in striking down state legislation. But we have seen a number of high stakes cases in recent years decided by a single vote, including the area we're focusing on today, elections and access to the political process, um, with the very real possibility of other seats opening up during the Trump administration, including the, re the possible retirement by Justice Kennedy at some point during the next four years, there may well be some shifts in important areas of law coming in our near future. One thing to keep in mind uh, is that contrary to what many people believe, um, including many of my students, uh, progress toward greater access and inclusion in the political process has never been linear. Uh, as Alex Kazar at Harvard Brilliant <coughs> demonstrates in his book, The Right to Vote, the nation has seen periods of expansion and contraction of the franchise. Some free blacks and some women were able to vote at the time of the founding. But by the early 19th century, laws barred that voting. Property qualifications for white male voters were removed from state laws by the 1840s, so that we very nearly had universal white male suffrage by that time. While the 15th Amendment seemed to promise blacks the right to vote, uh, right to vote by the 1890s, Restrictions that did not specifically mention race were instituted and usually upheld by the court, effectively accomplishing their disenfranchisement. With the influx of so many immigrants for southern, southern and eastern Europe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, literacy tests and other means of disenfranchising immigrant working class men flourished in the North as well. The franchise expanded to women, to 18-year-olds, and barriers to voting by African Americans began to be dismantled with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. While American Indians, this is little known, uh, became US citizens in 1924 if they weren't already, because some were made citizens by other agreements and treaties. Voting rights were denied to American Indians in a number of states, even into the early 1950s. It is only roughly since the mid-1960s that it can be said that the U.S. has moved toward universal voting rights. And that momentum 
has arguably shifted since 2000. The court did participate in the process of expanding the right to vote or making the right to vote more meaningful in the 1960s to roughly 2000. One exception, however, is worth noting. Uh, this dealt with the disenfranchisement of convicted felons. Whether while they were serving their sentences, sentences plus parole for a period of time after that, or even for life. The practice started to become popular in the late 19th century, not coincidentally after passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments. However, in Richardson versus Ramirez, uh, the court decided that states were entitled to make this determination under Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. Section 2 provides that states that deny or abridge the right to vote in federal or state elections to any male inhabitants of the state 21 years of age, of course that was changed to 18 with the amendment, um, uh, who are citizens of the United States, quote, except for participation in rebellion or other crime, unquote. The basis of representation will be reduced in proportion. Now the court held in Richardson versus Ramirez in 1974 that this provision in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which probably was not designed to reach convicted felons, it was probably, they were thinking more about civil war uh, uh, crimes, um, that, it, that it allowed states to deny the right to vote following the felony, felony conviction. It is extremely unlikely, for various reasons, and I can elaborate, that the current court would change this ruling or expand the constitutional right to vote, requiring some federal intervention in what those states are doing. But on other fronts, the court did address voting inequities during this period that began uh, uh, roughly in the 1950s. In entering what Justice Felix Frankfurter called a political thicket uh, with state reapportionment uh, for the first case, first time in a case that was not explicitly racially driven, um, um, because previous to Baker versus Carr in 1962, uh, reapportionment had not been considered a 14th Amendment equal protection matter, but rather a guarantee clause issue under Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution that said, began, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. Under the guarantee clause, reapportionment was considered a non-justiciable political issue, best left to the other branches. <coughs> So starting in 1849, Roger Taney says, we don't do guarantee clause cases. And reapportionment was considered a guarantee clause case. So this, keep this in mind when we get around to talking about uh, political gerrymandering uh, toward the end of the talk. So starting in Baker and then following in Reynolds versus Sims, the court begins to demand that uh, legislative districts contain equal numbers of voters, not just for federal, but also for state elections. Two years later, in Reynolds versus Sims, uh, Earl Warren wrote for the court, undoubtedly the right of suffrage is a fundamental matter in a free and democratic society, especially since the right to exercise the franchise in a free and unimpaired manner is preservative of other basic civil and political rights any alleged infringement of the right of citizens to vote must be carefully and meticulously scrutinized. A few years later, Justice um, William O. Douglas wrote in a case that I remember because I was from Virginia, the political franchise of voting is a fundamental political right because preservative of all rights says Douglas in a case striking down the poll tax. The court majority there stated a view that has been more recently associated with Justice Anthony Kennedy and Obergefell. Notions of what constitutes equal treatment for purposes of equal protection change. We have long been mindful, uh, uh, Douglas says in Harper, 
where fundamental rights and liberties are asser asserted under equal protection, classifications which might invade or restrain them must be closely scrutinized and carefully confined. The court supported early voting rights enforcement efforts, and only in 1993 did the court begin on a trajectory that would lead us to the famous, infamous case of Shelby County versus Holder in 2013. How many people know about this case? Oh, okay, so, uh, good, thank you. I was afraid I wasn't pitching this right, but I think that'll be fine. In Shaw versus Reno 1, because there are several Shaw versus Reno cases, uh, back in 1993, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor held that recognizing race or classifying by race for purposes of drawing legislative districts, even for remedial purposes, uh, ran afoul of the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, the Justice Department was um, encouraging states <coughs> to establish majority-minority districts so that African Americans might have a chance to elect the candidate of their choice in a situation where whites vote for whites and don't cross over and never vote for blacks. So um, Justice, uh, c quoting Justice Harlan in his Plessy dissent, uh, dissent back in 1896, O'Connor said the Constitution is colorblind. That language has been used in Brown, but it was used in a different way in Shaw to basically equate recognizing race with apartheid. I go through this brief history because we can't understand the cases I want to talk about without it. Um, I want to set this up this way. So this history also sets one interesting puzzle I want to think about. If voting is a fundamental right, preservative of all other rights, what do legal scholars expect to follow from that statement? I tell my students to bet, actually, if they hear particular language in a court, to bet on the outcome of the case, or to, to bet on what level of scrutiny the court has just said they're going to invoke. So you have to understand that the court has various levels of scrutiny that it uses when approaching different kinds of questions. There is no constitutional origin of these standards of scrutiny. These are part of the development of doctrine and precedent on the court. So there is rational basis review. There is heightened scrutiny, and there is strict scrutiny, and sometimes things don't quite fall neatly into any of those, but this is the basic idea. So, rational basis review asks, is there a rational or reasonable basis for the legislation, and is this properly a legislative matter? It maximizes legislative discretion, there's a strong presumption of validity. In fact, sometimes the court's willing to tell the legislature what its reason for doing the law, the, the, the legislation was. They don't have to give any reason. Um, the challenger bears all burdens of proof in any kind of a rationality review. So if you see rationality review, assume that the challenge to the law is likely to fail, except I can tell you some exceptions later. The next level of scrutiny is intermediate or heightened scrutiny. Does the legislation or does the classification, for example, gender, uh, serve an important governmental interest? Is the means chosen substantially related to the achievement of these objectives? There are a few other lines that they use, but this is good enough. So intermediate scrutiny famously is used for gender discrimination because the court thinks there's some ways in which women and men might differ and so we don't want to assume that you can never recognize uh, gender. The final one is strict scrutiny. Is there a compelling state interest in the legislation or classification? Is the measure absolutely necessary? Or sometimes they just say necessary to accomplish a compelling state objection. Is it the least intrusive of rights that could have been adopted? Um, so when there's a fundamental right or if there is a core political right, like free speech, especially political speech, because you need to think about this when we, get, when we talk briefly about Citizens United. If there's a fundamental right, the expectation is that the burden falls on the legislature in question, whether it's the federal or the state legislature, to demonstrate that 
there is a compelling state interest in the regulation or the burden that's being placed on a right. And there's a very strong presumption against the constitutionality of the regulation in question. It's a very high barrier to overcome. As some justices have remarked, the invocation of strict scrutiny is almost always fatal in fact. I tell my students that I used to be able to count on one hand the times the court has invoked, invoked strict scrutiny and the legislative measure withstands it. One example is Korematsu during World War II. There was a, the, the court acknowledged that it was a classification based on race and said there may be no military necessity that warrants this segregation and confinement of Japanese on the West Coast. Now I'm probably up to two hands. I've been teaching a long time, but actually most of the, most of the changes have been recent. And they actually, most of them deal with affirmative action. So uh, I can answer questions about that. I'm going to go on. So with this in mind, let's talk about voter ID bills. The most important case here is the 2008 case of Crawford versus Marion County Election Board. How many people know about that? OK, Jack. Um, all right, so the um, Indiana and Georgia have a very similar law, but this case made the laws of Indiana and Georgia the model for another, a, a number of other states that wanted to institute strict government-issued photo ID laws. Indiana was smart enough to provide a means for would-be voters to get such an ID for free, because if they hadn't, they would have run afoul of Harper versus the Board of Elections that I was just talking about. You can't make the right to vote conditional on paying something that smells or looks like a poll tax. You can't make people pay for the ID. Well, the challenge to Crawford was what's called a facial challenge. The 2008 bill hadn't yet been implemented, uh, and they were trying to stop it from being implemented in the 2008 election. Prospective voters claimed that they would be disenfranchised because of the difficulty of obtaining the documents necessary to get the free ID, the travel time, you know, the elderly and disabled having to get on buses and go uh, to, at some distance to try to secure the necessary ID. The court did not consider the burdens, the potential burdens on the right to vote sufficient to outweigh the state's interest in the integrity of the electoral process. Instead of using strict scrutiny, the Harper standard, the court used some kind of a balancing test, which is one of the lower tests, uh, and they felt that the inconvenience uh, inconvenience was not a sufficient burden on the right to vote to stop Indiana uh, from pursuing a legitimate state interest in the integrity and reliability of the electoral process. So Indiana had not written the law in such a way that it was clearly aimed at blacks, though it could well disproportionately affect those without driver's licenses, including the poor, elderly, and urban residents, many of whom were black. So Crawford versus Marion County gave a green light to states that wanted to tighten access to the franchise. But under strict scrutiny, arguably, shouldn't the state have had to demonstrate the problem for which strict voter IDs provide the solution? <laughs> I'm going to make this even more ironic before I'm done. <laughs> there may be fraud in absentee, absentee ballot, but most legislation, most of the state legislation is not aimed at absentee voters. It is aimed at in-person voter fraud. And I, I bet a lot of you go and work at polls. How many people work at polls? There's not a lot of in-person voter fraud. That is where somebody comes in and tries to impersonate someone else, or vote twice, or vote when they are not permitted to do so. In this last category, people who try to vote when they're not permitted to do so are felons who thought their voting rights were res restored and were just wrong. You know, they didn't understand that they weren't supposed to be voting. But those people are prosecuted. 
There is no evidence, I'm telling you this as a social scientist, there is no evidence of significant in-person voter fraud in the United States. I don't care about alternative facts. There is none. <laughs> <laughs> they no, they didn't. Voter IDs are a solution in search of a problem, and they do impose substantial burdens on certain classes of people, many of whom tend to vote for one party rather than the other. Now, we could make an argument that there are some systems where voter IDs were provided to everybody that wouldn't be cumbersome, but that's not what we've got, so I'm going to leave it at that for the moment. Hazar, who wrote the book The Right to Vote, argued that movements to restrict or expand the right to vote are linked to party competition and to periods of close contestation of elections. Notice the fact that in both 2000 and 2016, the popular vote and the electoral vote diverged in the United States. In 2004 and 2012, the popular election for president was relatively close. And compared to landslides, 2008 was still reasonably close in terms of popular vote, not electoral vote. The move to restrict um, which voter IDs must be viewed as follows the election of 2000, not coincidentally, and also a couple of moves by the federal government to expand the right to vote, such as uh, the National Voter Regist Registration Act of 1993, known as Motor Voter. I'm not going to talk about these, but this expands access to the right to vote. Uh, when you go get your driver's license, you're asked if you want to register to vote. You know, and, things like that. Uh, and also the uh, Help America Vote Act of 2002, uh, which also was designed to make voting easier. So every action seems to breed a counteraction, and especially in the aftermath of the election of 2000. Before moving to racial barriers to voting in Shelby County versus Holder, I want to make one more point about what the election of 2000 meant in terms of the right to vote. In Bush versus Gore, the majority's per curiam decision held the individual citizen has no federal constitutional right to vote for electors for president of the United States unless and until the state legislature chooses a statewide election as the means to implement its power to appoint members of the Electoral College. Put that in simpler language, there is no federal constitutional right to vote for president of the United States, period, the end. Now that came as a surprise to many people. <laughs> <laughs> now, the court was right in a very formalistic sense. The court leaves many matters relating to elections in the hands of states. However, Congress may intervene in the time, place, and manner of holding elections, except as to the place of choosing senators. That is, there are places in the Constitution, this being one, where the framers wag their fingers and say, uh, you will never, without a state's consent, remove uh, its two votes, in the equal votes in the Senate. Um, so the Congress could do more to standardize elections if they chose, but Congress has chosen to op operate mostly by carrots, like money to upgrade voting equipment, without specifying a type, um, rather than by sticks. And states determine how to choose electors. By 1832, most states uh, most um, states chose electors by popular vote, and by 1868, when South Carolina uh, got on board, uh, all states chose their uh, uh, chose electors by popular vote. But to the formalist, if states wanted to return this power to the legislatures, they were well within their rights to do so. A long history of practice does not a constitutional rule make for formalists. So now let me talk about Shelby County versus Holder, the 2013 decision that invalidated the formula devised by Congress to determine states and portions of states covered by Section 5 pre-clearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Here we are talking about racial restrictions on voting. States with a history of barring uh, or a discriminatory practice with regard to African American voting were covered. And here is a map of states and parts of states covered. 
And no, New Hampshire did not discriminate against blacks because there were other provisions here. Uh, if a state, uh, in a, over a, at a certain point in time, uh, if the participation in elections was under 50%, they were also covered. Uh, so, um, uh, at, at any rate, uh, we are <coughs> states with the history uh, were covered. There were opportunities under the act to bail out if you were good for 10 years, and some areas have been able to bail out. Any change to voting rules, districting, had to be pre-cleared by the Department of Justice. Now, other states, you could say that this treats states differently. Other states and jurisdictions could make such changes without the change being subject to the approval of the Department of Justice. So it did treat, yes? Could you just tell us what the colors mean? Because we can't read. I'm not sure I could see it myself. Um, <laughs> county coverage, uh, township coverage, the, the perp they can be, uh, what do you call that, fuchsia? That mm -hmm. is, is township coverage. Uh, the blue is county coverage. Uh, and I think the, the red is statewide coverage. Uh, uh, and so they're not telling you the reasons for coverage. They're just showing you what is covered. Um, so um, uh, the Department of Justice for states that were not covered uh, could come after a jurisdiction for voting rights violations, but only under Section 2 that was sort of a case-by-case, -case, uh, bring, a, bring a legal case against them. And that's a, a costly and cumbersome way to enforce voting rights by comparison, but that's now what the Department of Justice is left with after Shelby County versus Holder for the most part. The court, as I said earlier, has backed up Congress on voting rights, giving the Department of Justice wide berth in enforcing the Voting Rights Act, uh, including early on the Department of Justice's attempt to create majority-minority districts, uh, which brought more African Americans to Congress than ever before. Since roughly eight, 1989, however, the court has held that discrimination on the basis of race should be examined under strict scrutiny, and that includes benign race-based classifications introduced for remedial purposes. But racial discrimination in voting would presumably be held to the highest level of scrutiny. However, there's another clicker, clunker here. The court in the late 1990s began, began to read Congress's power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment and Section 2 of the 15th Amendment more restrictively. Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, the Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article, that same that same um, clause is in a lot of amendments, and it's section two of the 15th Amendment, I believe. Um, so um, this becomes part of a complaint that people make that uh, the court was arrogating to itself the sole power to define equal protection. Let me show how that looks. Congress had been proactive in legislating to promote equal protection. The court begins to argue in a, in a famous case called Birney versus Flores. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing the name of the Texas town right. It's either Birney or Birney. Uh, that there has to have been a pattern of state violations of equal protections before Congress can act under Section 5. The remedy has to be, quote, congruent and proportional to the violation. Congress cannot define equal protection for itself. The Supreme Court's definition is the only one that counts. And Congress, therefore, cannot, when it comes to race because of strict scrutiny, enforce against the states a, defini a definition of equal protection that is more liberal than the courts. This turns out to be a really big deal. Uh, in fact, it gives us Hobby Lobby. If you want to know how, I'll tell you later. But it basically, uh, the case, the Bierney case says the Religious Freedom Restoration Act cannot be applied against the states it can be applied against the federal government. So there was a storm brewing over the Voting Rights Act because the court had declared colorblindness to be the meaning of equal protection, meaning laws could not recognize race for remedial purposes, The Congress couldn't use Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to reach anything but documented violations of equal protection, and the court was ratcheting up the level of scrutiny it was using to examine congressional fact-finding about the need for pre-clearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. 
The fact-finding was necessary in order to impose remedies. Despite congressional evidence and fears that states would backslide, the court deemed the evidence of continued violations or the need for Section 5 to be highly questionable in 2009 and told Congress in a case that's known as Mudnode, Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District Number 1, but it has an acronym, told Congress to go back and develop some coverage formula that applied not just to previously covered districts, but that would apply to everybody. Congress, being highly polarized and rather dysfunctional, didn't even think about doing that, so they just reauthorized, you know, they left it alone. Roberts, in the 2009 case, says the state's dignity is at stake. The states are entitled to equal dignity. So Shelby County leaves the DOJ with only the method of taking a state to court for voting rights violations, and it takes money and it takes personnel for enforcement, and I'm sure the Trump administration has no intention of giving the DOJ much of a leash for enforcing those kinds of provisions. Now, I really don't want to spend a whole lot more time. I'm going to hit a couple of points about the other cases and then open it up to discussion. One of the other interesting looming cases, and Barbara mentioned it, but I was shaking my head because I wanted to correct something, if you don't mind. In, oh, well, I didn't do much with that slide. Vieth v. Jubilee, a Pennsylvania case. You know about that. This issue, we dodged a bullet, depending on what side of the issue you're on. You can never know who we is here. But I think that the court came very close in this case of partisan gerrymandering, which gives Republicans an advantage in the electoral districts that they drew. But that's why who occupies the legislature in a year ending in a zero is at a great advantage because they get to draw or have drawn the electoral districts. Pennsylvania had lost a couple of seats, and the Republicans were in a position to redesign the system to favor themselves if they so chose. Remember when I talked about the non-justiciable political question? Well, the political questions doctrine is that if the court can't, if the issue is clearly consigned to a different branch of government, the court has no business in there. And if the court can't find any judicially manageable standard for resolving it, resolving the problem, then there's a prudential reason to stay out of the business. And districting often causes that. Districting is messy, and it's time-honored. Gerrymandering, you know, try to do in your political opponent has been part of districting for a very long time. The term even comes from Elbridge Gerry, the Massachusetts governor who drew districts that were designed, that said they looked like salamanders, so they called it gerrymandering. But four members of the court, the conservatives, held in Jubilee that political gerrymandering was a non-justiciable political question. To say that means we're done. The court will never look at this stuff again. That's why I blocked it. It's sort of the opposite. Well, they didn't decide it because I was four members of the court. Justice Kennedy said, I agree in this case that I don't know what the standards are, so I agree with the majority in this case. But I refuse to give up the possibility that there might be some standards that could be devised that would be judicially manageable. So I refuse to call this case, I refuse to say that political gerrymandering is off the table as a political question. 
and boy were the conservatives mad at him. So we came within one vote. By the way, the court that's very unrestrained in many other ways would have done something somewhat restrained in saying it's a political question, we're never going to look at it again. But the effect of that would mean that political gerrymandering was a free-for-all with no judicial oversight, period. Okay. So we came really close to that decision and could get there yet, okay? Could easily get there yet. Let me talk a bit about Citizens United uh, and then open it up, and this will be brief. Citizens United and the Fletcher versus Federal Election Commission. The old Buckley framework from the mid-1970s is the framework that still on paper is the rule. That money is sort of like speech, but that some speech is more protected than other speech. With contribution, political contributions, we don't know the reason why you're giving the money other than you know, you're supporting the candidate or I support my students. I'll give a little money when my students are running for office. Um, it doesn't convey a clear political message. So the court decided in Buckley that that's not core political speech and could be viewed under what's called intermediate scrutiny. And they allowed the federal government, allowed Congress to regulate and set some limits on contributions for both the primary and then the general election cycle. But <coughs> expenditures did constitute core political speech because they were the views of the candidate or the campaign or the party. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, candidate and the campaign. That this was core political speech and had to be looked at under strict scrutiny. Okay. So basically, restrictions on expenditures were fell, but restrictions on contributions <coughs> were permissible. That's the Buckley framework. The Buckley framework hangs by a thread, but there have been some changes, some major changes, in since Citizens United uh, and and McCutcheon. First, the only warrant for congressional action is quid pro quo corruption, and no longer the appearance of corruption, or the impact of appearance of corruption on the public's faith in the integrity of the political process, electoral process. Here's my last little irony. Remember when I was talking about Crawford versus Marion County and the state's interest in the integrity of the electoral process? That was taken as, of course, the, of course the state does. Of course the state does. But here, Congress, the, the state can do something for which it provides no evidence that there's a problem of to protect the integrity of the electoral process, but the federal government can't. Okay. So, slight irony in my view. But uh, we, we, there are plenty of other things about, uh, about Citizens United and the role of, of corporate money. Corporates, corporations have speech rights. Uh, corporations have religious expression rights. That's not from those cases, but it's from Hobby Lobby. Um, that have that have important impact on faith in the integrity of the electoral process and indeed how money is being used in electoral politics. But that will have to be either the subject of another talk or maybe a little bit more in discussion. Um, I'm going to stop and leave it to you for, for questions. Thanks. <laughs>